What's your name anyway? Hey, kid. It's a big shot gangster. He's putting together a crew. You think everything sounds like a bad idea? If you come with me, you're in this life for good. I waited a long time for a shot like this. I got a really good feeling about this. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. All of it. The force. It's calling to you. May the force be with us. My nerd road. Just let it in. Oh, job up. Why does she get a blaster and I do? Oh, job up. There is going to be this very interesting connective tissue with all of these Star Wars movies. We started off with the latest TV spot, the first of what will most likely be a lot of TV spots for Solo, a Star Wars story. It's really good. And again, like I said in last week's episode, I'm so excited for Solo, a Star Wars story. Uh, More so now than I was for for Rogue One, and maybe my memory isn't serving me correctly. Maybe it's just because I wasn't that excited about the Solo movie, and now I'm really excited about the Solo movie. But like I said last week, what this has to offer and what it can do for the franchise moving forward has me really, really excited. But I forget the connective tissue. I I forget that we are going to get more details and more of a backstory on this beloved character that so many of us watched growing up as kids, saw make a return in uh, The Force Awakens, and of course ultimately die, but then still see his legacy of Han Solo remain throughout The Last Jedi. I mean, you can't you can't um, discount the effect that Han had, obviously, on Rey and certainly on Leia. I'm looking at the poster for The Force Awakens right now. And and uh, this movie is going to be very different. But again, it all has this this connective tissue. Now, not, not all these movies are going to be this way. Um, I, I, I don't believe that when it comes to this trilogy, we're going to perhaps have as much connective tissue if we do something completely apart from the saga films because all the movies so far still have had that that sort of uh that sort of connection but not only am i excited for this story that's going to be told and what looks to be just a really really fun tale i'm also excited for what this movie will do for the for the other movies and that's part of what we'll be talking about on the show this week. Welcome uh, to My Nerd World and the uh, Star Wars Podcast. I'm your host, John Justice. We're on uh, episode 119. Uh, We do have a little bit of Han Solo news. There's actually quite a bit of Han Solo news, but nothing that I really want to completely dive dive into. It's a different movie. And when it comes to doing the show, I mean, obviously I choose choose the things that I want to go and talk about, but uh, I'm not as in diving into the minutia when it comes to um, solo a Star Wars story, except just just kind of picking and choosing the the little things that I want to uh, that I want to discuss. I am going to talk uh, a little bit about Return of the Jedi this week and do a little bit of comparison with Return of the Jedi and the Last Jedi. 
And the reason being is that it's kind of happenstance. I was working in my office the other day, and I threw on Return of the Jedi. I uh, just had it on in the background while I was while I was working. I'm been I know shocking. Been in a Star Wars mood as of late. Took a bit of a break. I was watching some other films and have been um, sort of enjoying some other franchises as of late. And uh, hadn't 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 visited you know for about a week, week and a half now the the Star Wars galaxy. And I was like, oh, I'm in the mood for Star Wars. So. Um, Return of the Jedi is arguably, don't hate me, uh, my least favorite Star Wars movie. I love them all, but of the ones that I love, uh, it's probably my least favorite. And so it's the one that I don't mind putting on in my office in the background. Um, I don't mind. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say wasting a viewing, but if I'm not going to be fully paying attention to any Star Wars movie, then I don't mind putting Return of the Jedi on in the background. However... Something very, very interesting happened <laughs> while I was watching it. I started to notice things in the movie that had it been released today, the way The Last Jedi was, in the world that we live in. If Return of the Jedi had been released, now live in, at the same time that like The Last Jedi did, I would be hard-pressed how... Return of the Jedi would not have been roasted by that portion of the fandom that continues to go and give The Last Jedi so much grief. And I'll do my best not to go and point to particular podcasts, and this is not me wanting, I'm not, my desire is not to focus on the negativity. My desire is to provide with evidence and clarity how ridiculous some of that negativity in the fandom has been. That's not to say that people suddenly need to go and like The Last Jedi. But if you like Return of the Jedi and you don't like The Last Jedi for the majority of the reasons that people say they don't like The Last Jedi, then you probably shouldn't like Return of the Jedi. Does that make sense? I don't care if you don't like The Last Jedi. That's on you. But if you're going to criticize it, you need to be honest in your criticism. And I don't think a lot of people have been honest in their criticism. I think nostalgia is getting in the way of their proper viewing of The Last Jedi and just how closely al aligned it is to a, a movie like Return of the Jedi. And I could look, I could probably do the same thing when it comes to The Empire Strikes Back and A New Hope. It just happened to be that Return of the Jedi was the one that I was watching, so I jotted down some notes to compare Return of the Jedi to The, uh, to the Last Jedi. Um, also, watch The Force Awakens over the weekend. A couple of quick observations that I wanted to make on that, and then we're going to dive right into the listener feedback portion of the show. So that'll give you just sort of a, a brief overview of what you can expect uh, this week. Uh, let's go ahead and dive right into it then. This is not going to go the way you think. All right, so um, comparing The Last Jedi to Return of the Jedi. And I just have a quick a, a couple of quick notes here that I want to uh, that I want to run through. Uh we'll also be talking about like I said a little bit of solo this week before we get to the listener feedback portion of it. But um one thing that I wanted to 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 point out was I've heard some people criticize and this this has not been a widely held criticism, but I've heard some people criticize some of the use of the language that Ryan Johnson used in some of the phrasing in the movie. Now, granted, uh, there is some some wording and descriptions in the film that I'm gonna just I'm gonna pick on one that I personally have never heard of before. I like Ryan Johnson's writing quite a bit. He has a very old school quality to it, which I personally believe aligns itself very nicely with the way that George Lucas wrote. But a line like um dj had you know don't let the rapper fool you and a lot of the way that that dj spoke apart from the stuttering had a very different sort of vibe to it but the one line that i wanted to pick up on i've heard some people mention this was snoke and his rabid cur line okay i never heard of a rabid cur before um, the last Jedi was the first time I'd heard of that phrase and it really kind of threw me for, for a loop. Um, and I went and looked it up and, and saw what the kind of a rabid cur was. And I guess more specifically, I'd never heard of a dog being referred to as a, as a cur. So a rabid dog, you know, why do I, 
and the and the and the line of you wonder why I keep a rabid cur in such a place of of power. And I've heard people kind of point out, well, that you know that seems out of place. Nobody knows what that means. And well, you know, you watch um, Return of the Jedi, and as a kid, now granted, I was a kid when I saw it, but I'd never heard anybody use the term delusion of grandeur before. I just I remember as a kid delusion of grandeur. What in, what in the world is what in the world is that? So that's that's not a that's not the, the, the best comparison. But it just when we're looking at comparisons, and I've heard some people complain about the rabid cur line. Okay, well you can't you can't right you, you can't say that there weren't there wasn't stuff in the original trilogy that was a little bit off the beaten path either. Okay, this is a little bit more direct. I've heard people complain a lot about sort of the silliness, right? of The Last Jedi on a number of... Basically, the jokes, okay? If you do a joke count of the original trilogy, I, I'm sorry, you're going to come up short. The, every single movie has its fair share of jokes. Whether or not they land is a, whole, a completely different story. The Return of the Jedi has got a, has got a ton. You know, chewy, always thinking with your, with your stomach. Uh, I didn't know I had it in me. Uh, the list goes on and on. But the one that really, really sticks out to me I'm going to compare the Luke space cow milking scene. And for those that had a hard time and thought that that was too much and too bizarre. I'm sorry, but the core keeper, you know, the no shirt, overweight, dirty dude. Sobbing over the death of the Rancor. You compare that to the Luke milking scene. If you didn't like the Luke milking scene, but you were fine with the Rancor dude sobbing over the Rancor, come on now. Not to mention that Rancor scene, that little moment, it's like, it's like three times as long as Luke, you know, milking the, milking the space cow, right? And nobody seemed to complain either. I'm kind of going, nobody really seemed to complain either in The Force Awakens when when Finn was drinking out of the Habibor's water pit and it was all gross and he knocks him out of the way. Okay, so that's neither here nor here. All right, and this is kind of a big one. People, and I've heard this in many, many places, people complain about why did Luke's metal hand, presuming it did, why did Luke's metal hand disappear when he died, spoiler alert, at the end of The Last Jedi? And we've heard um, Ryan Johnson addressed that they had contemplated putting in the last Jedi, a little sort of dink noise, hearing the hand hit the ground there on the on the rock, and they didn't want to take out of the, uh, they didn't want to take the, you know, take any any emotional weight out of the out of the moment, right? So I'm watching the Jedi, and I actually watched this a few times. I was about a hundred percent sure before I went and watched this scene, but I did watch it several times just to make sure that I was right, and I was right. When Yoda disappears, his entire outfit goes with him. The only thing that's left after Yoda disappears in that scene is the blanket that he that was on top of him. His robes disappear right right along right along with him. Okay. If that movie at least and the best way to put it, and I think I was putting it wrong before, if Return of the Jedi had been released with the scrutiny that people put these movies now, it would have gotten slayed. Absolutely slayed. Now, I'm a firm believer. That everything happens for a reason. Okay, I, that's just that's just that that's what I believe. I do believe that Star Wars, thank the good Lord Almighty, came around at a time period where we didn't have all these things. I think the Star Wars is really really important. I think it's incredibly important. Right? Is it life or death important? Well, no, of course not. But it's a cultural phenomenon for a reason, and I think it's done untold amounts of good for humanity right people talk about the importance of art overall how important art is to society and i agree with that i don't think that we give enough credit to the artwork that is done in cinema i don't think we give enough credit to to what music does for us whether it's the writings of john williams or your favorite your favorite band and what it does for you even right down to to crappy, you know, um, pop music or Nickelback for crying out loud. You know, this is the stuff that people create those people that can have a, have a positive impact on people. And we so often talk about the beautiful paintings that deserve credit, right? 
and and sort of your standard what falls into the category of, of, of art. But these films are art, in my opinion. And the attention to detail and the messaging of these movies. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, again, I can only say so many times how big of an impact Star Wars has had on me and my life and, and, and the impact that it continues to have on me and my life. It still ends up being just this positive force for me. Even my desire to sit down weekly and record an hour to an hour and a half podcast to talk Star Wars is of great benefit to me, even if nobody listened. And thankfully you do, and I'm so appreciative of the response you give to the uh, to the show, right? But the but Star Wars came out at a time when it had getting back to my point of everything happens for a reason. Star Wars didn't come out at a time of intense scrutiny where we held these things up to such high standards. It came out at a time in the country where there was a lot of a lot of cynicism. Um, the, 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 the movie landscape at the time was very downbeat and it struck a chord and continued to strike a chord to the point where we are now so many years down the line from the original Star Wars movie. And because it's had such an impact, we do overanalyze these, these films. And in my opinion, they do get unfair criticism because of how important it's been to people's in, in people's lives. And if these movies had come out in the way that they did back then, now, with the ability to tear everything apart and then let as many people know as possible your opinions on this, I don't think it ever would have survived. And I also think that it speaks to the power and how great these movies are, even a movie like The Last Jedi being as popular as it was, even with the backlash, I would argue is more popular than a lot of people believe because of the fact that we all have the ability to go and voice our opinions now, right? That movie is still applauded and loved and still made a lot of money, broke records when it came out on Blu-ray, despite the fact that everybody can go and comment on it. I had an entire show that talked about how The Last Jedi was a masterpiece. And it, it, it is. And, it's a, and it's, a, it's a piece of art. And I would even go so far as to argue that there was more care given and attention to detail and meaning and devotion to this franchise that was put into The Last Jedi than there was in Return of the Jedi. It's not to say Return of the Jedi isn't a good movie. I, I do love that movie, even if it is my last favorite of all the films. But when you consider the attention to detail... Look, he did a better job, in my opinion, than what Lucas did in Revenge of the Sith. I don't think a Johnson would have let go the... The fact that Padme was only a brief period of time when the twins were born, and yet in Return of the Jedi, Leia talks about having these these memories. She was sad. You know, we need comic books to kind of fill that gap. And I don't let those things. There were things inside of Revenge of the Sith that I really wish that Lucas had had done a little bit better job with, and that was one of them. A little bit more sort of consistency there, so we didn't have to do the sort of mental gymnastics. The guys that are in charge of these films now are going out of their way to not have to go and let that and let that happen, so that we as viewers can enjoy these movies without having to do those mental those mental gymnastics. So again, I I just wanted to point that out. And when you hear those those critiques and that criticism online, um. You know, kind of the way that I've started handling it is I started I started thinking about how, you know, if somebody came up to me that I'd never met before and started con complaining to me about The Last Jedi, I kind of would look at him and go, take a hike. I don't know you. And I do the same thing now when it comes to negative content because, you know what, it's my channel and um, I can do what I want. 
<laughs> so a lot of time, and thankfully there hasn't been. A, there there was quite a bit of negativity in some earlier shows of the Last Jedi. Thankfully there hasn't been all that negativity uh, in a in a while. But any negativity that pops up on there, I just delete it because I don't have any time for that. And honestly, it's I'd rather have you a better, more enjoyable experience than have to go and listen to individuals and their stupid, irrational criticism of something that. Uh, you know, that the rest of us love so much. Fulfill your destiny. All right, uh, shifting gears a bit. Uh, watching The Force Awakens over the weekend, uh, and a, a thought popped into my head. And the thought that popped into my head was, The Force Awakens is really ki- kind of an appetizer. I, again, this is not a criticism. Don't misunderstand. When you compare it to The Last Jedi and what Ryan Johnson was able to do, the amount of depth in The Force Awakens is very... It's the shallow end of the deeper pool that consists of both movies. And I imagine that when we when we see this trilogy wrap up, it's going to be much in the same way the original trilogy played out, where we start off kind of shallow, we go pretty deep in the middle, and then we kind of come back up to the a bit of the shallow end again to, to close it out. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I'm perfectly fine with that, with that arc. But watching The Last Jedi, for as much as I love that movie, I really did get that sense of, man, I just, I want to, I'm like, I'm watching it thinking, oh, I want to get to The Last Jedi again. I want to go and watch that. It makes me want to watch The Last Jedi. And the other thing that I realized watching it this week was, even though I'm older, one of the things that was so, that made the original trilogy so endearing for so many of us was watching these characters, and specifically Luke and Leia, grow up on screen. I feel like we're seeing a better version of that in the sequel trilogy. And a lot of that has to do with 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 my memory because at the time I was so young compared to Luke Skywalker, so I wasn't looking at Luke being a young sort of kid. I was looking at him being older than I was. But we did watch those characters grow up on grow up on screen. And I'm so thankful for the sequel trilogy because now I can look at this through the other through the other lens. I can look at the sequel trilogy much in the same way that my dad watched the original trilogy and then see these characters grow up in real life and on screen. Seeing Daisy Ridley in The Force Awakens, she was really young. That one, the first scene with her on Jakku. When she meets BB-8 and she runs over and she hears BB-8 making the making the noise because Tito is trying to capture him, and she grabs her staff and runs for it. I remember watching that going, wow, by comparison, she looks so young. But they all do. And and that of course is what Ryan Johnson ended up using as a as as a as a catalyst and a means to write his story was this is what we're seeing these individuals going from adolescence into adulthood what does that look like what ends up happening as they transition what does that do to their personalities and thankfully he decided to do that by utilizing Ray and Ben getting to Raylo a bit because you could have done that a, a number of different ways. You didn't have to go the route of having those two be the, again, connective tissue should have named that this week's show, but I'm not, but I should have, that would have, they are the connective tissue. Ryan Johnson didn't, didn't need to go that way, but I agree with him that those are the two most interesting characters. And that's what made for the most compelling story. I agree with him that that was the, that was the route to go. And I'm so thankful for that. Because to me, that is what sets the sequel trilogy apart from the from the original trilogy. You know, people want to go and talk about the comparisons of The Force Awakens, less so with The Last Jedi. We are getting some themes. We are, the way the movies are crafted are obviously very similar. Some of the set pieces are reminiscent of each other. But the way that the sequel trilogy separates itself out from the, from the original trilogy is something that I'm so grateful for because we didn't get this. We didn't get this this tension. I won't say romance. It could. 
there's an argument to be made for that. But for, for, for the sake of argument, we'll just say the tension between these two opposite dual protagonists in this movie is very different than what we got in the original trilogy. More akin to the prequel trilogy, although handled in a much different and albeit, in my opinion, you know, sort of in, in, a, in, a better, in, in a better way. But just one more quick point on this particular, I just want to pull on this thread just a, just a, just a little bit more. The one thing about all these movies, and I mentioned at the start of, of this week's show, is they do make the other movies better, in my opinion. Rogue One complements A New Hope. Rogue One puts A New Hope in a position where I look at it through a, another lens that I didn't have beforehand. Having the backstory, seeing the Death Star, watching that end battle, knowing what the 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 group had to do in Rogue One to get the rebels to that point. It adds a level of, a level of depth that wasn't with a new hope uh before. Right? Obviously uh the uh, the Force Awakens does that for the last Jedi and the last Jedi does that for the Force Awakens. Watching the Force Awakens now, I'm looking at it through a different lens, knowing what comes next, seeing the interaction of these characters, especially Rey and Kylo. I mean, those scenes from The Force Awakens now are so much more meaningful and better than they were before The Last Jedi existed. And this is also what I expect and what I'm hoping for when it comes to Solo, a Star Wars story. Is that I'm really excited to see what Solo, a Star Wars story does for all the movies that come that come after it. Rogue One probably aside. I don't think we're going to have a lot of connective tissue. There it is again. To to Rogue One. But we're certainly going to think differently when we see Han for the first time in A New Hope. We're certainly going to think differently when we see Han and his interaction with Ben Solo in The Force Awakens. And I wonder if we'll look at Ben Solo differently in The Last Jedi and what we haven't seen yet in in Episode 9. On a non-personal um, example, the Millennium Falcon. I can't tell you how excited I am to see why the Millennium Falcon ends up looking like the piece of junk it ends up looking like <laughs> in all the other movies. That that ship is so iconic. And and especially, this is what I also love, especially how it's utilized, how the Millennium Falcon is utilized in The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi. Because they do such a good job using that ship in both those movies. It is such a character. It has so much character. And again, I think that this is something that they've done a better job in the sequel trilogy than they did in the original trilogy. Again, not to say that in the original trilogy they didn't handle the Millennium Falcon in such a way, but by the time we get to the sequel trilogy, The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, the Millennium Falcon has now achieved iconic status, and it is handled as such. They make it visually stunning. They get, it has more personality and character, and I am so excited to be able to see how that plays out in Solo, a Star Wars story, because we know that we're going to find out how it goes from Lando Calrissian's pleasure craft to the piece of junk that we end up seeing in uh, in A New Hope. I can't tell you. I went out shopping for uh, for Solo toys on uh, on Friday, and thankfully, um, ended up going by a Target by my house, and they were fully stocked up. Not compared to the Walmart that I went to today on the way home on Monday, where they had nothing. Um, but they had pretty much everything that I was looking for. And one of the things I got, and I was so excited to get it, was the uh, the smaller die cast of the of the Millennium Falcon from Solo: A Star Wars Story. Um, I've put I haven't opened up all my toys yet. I got the speeder, and I got Kira, and I got Han in the speeder, the blue speeder that we see in the trailer. It's pretty awesome. I'm actually looking at it right now in my room. But the uh, the Millennium Falcon has been sitting up where I sit and watch TV. And I've been playing with that thing while I sit there just looking at it because I just think it's awesome. And I can't wait to see that story that story play out. Not to mention the, the, the fact that we're going to not only get the background on Chewie, and I think that Chewie's going to be a big part of this movie, this, the solo movie, but Lando as Lando well. 
you know, anybody that didn't have any faith in what Kathleen Kennedy and Disney was was doing with these with these films is completely off their rocker. They know exactly what they're doing. And I won't repeat what I said in last week's show, but this movie is coming at exactly the right at exactly the right time. And we're going to get past Solo a Star Wars story. And mark my words, people are going to be clamoring for episode nine. It's going to be a long year and a half wait from Solo, a Star, a Star Wars story, until we end episode nine the following December. There has been an awakening. Have you felt it? So I do you have a little bit more to talk about with Solo, um, a Star Wars story. There's a couple of items here that I want to get into. Most of it is coming from Empire Magazine has uh, put out a profile on the on the movie, and there's a couple of points and things that I want to uh, I want to talk about. But let's 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 get into the mood. What I'm going to play for you is uh, is a supercut. This is uh this is a, the super trailer super trailer. Somebody went and I want to say it was makingstarwars.net, makingstarwars.newsnet. Sorry guys, I'm pretty sure they're the ones that put this together. But what they did was we had those initial two teasers that came out back to back. A super trailer of it. It's really, really good. Uh, the edits are really clean. I love the music that they've used in these trailers. We played the the one-minute TV spot, and every single clip that's been released. We've had the two trailers, the full trailer, the minute TV spot. Um, I love the the use of music, and, and I like it because we're breaking norms. We're breaking tradition, and I think that's really, really important. I think it's important that... We get used to this idea of Star Wars not having to obey all these rules that were laid out. And I also think, without going back to The Last Jedi, but I also think that's part of the reason why people had a hard time with The Last Jedi was because, in a lot of people's minds, it kind of broke a bit of the rules that we're, that we're used to. By the way, one more quick thing, and I apologize. I'm all over the map this week in the show, so I, 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 it's probably always like this, but I feel like I'm all over the map. Going back to what I mentioned with the comparisons, just real quick, people that give Canto Bite a hard time from The Last Jedi, really, you're giving Canto Bite a hard time, but you're giving the whole Jabba Palace opening scene of Return of the Jedi a free pass? I'm sorry. I just don't see that. <laughs> I personally think the Fathers are exponentially cooler and more fun to watch than the Rancor fight. I really, really do. Okay, I just needed to get that out of my out of my system. All right, so, um, <laughs> music. I don't know if this is what we're going to get in the film. I'm fine if it is. I think it's really, really important. Solo, a Star Wars story, is going to serve um, a very... And a lot the way that Rogue One was kind of dipping our toe into the waters of changing things. We had a different, um, you know, we had we had somebody different scoring the film other than Williams. But he did kind of a John Williams-esque score. And I think that Solo can really afford the opportunity to really step out what we're used to. And the music is certainly doing that. So, what you're going to want for Solo a Star Wars Story, which is basically just a combination of the first two teaser trailers that were released around the Super Bowl. So you want to make a difference? Yeah. Trust me, you're going to love it. And which branch are you interested in joining? I'm going to be a pilot. Best in the galaxy. I've been running scams on the street since I was 10. I was kicked out of the flight academy for having a mind of my own. Hey, kid. I'm putting together a crew. You in? That's yes. I might be the only person. Who knows? What you really are. What's that? Oh, 
were in trouble there for a second, but it's fine. We're fine. Oh, ah! Your name? I cannot wait to get to know these characters, and I can't wait to see Alden Ehrenreich playing Han Solo. If somebody asked me who your favorite Star Wars character is, I, I honestly couldn't tell you because it, because it changes. It's like saying which one's my favorite Star Wars movie. I, I I can't right now. It's the Last Jedi, but that's tough because it changes. Right, The Empire Strikes Back usually tops that list, but. Well, there's sometimes when Attack of the Clones is, for as weird as that sounds. I think it depends on what kind of emotional state I'm in. But I cannot wait to see his portrayal of Han Solo. In the Empire Magazine article, it talks about um, the the way that Alden Ehrenreich was going to approach this character. And it says this. Um, it was clear from the beginning before this is it. this is Ron Howard, the director. It was clear from the beginning before I was involved that it was not going to be an impression of Harrison. No one wanted that. Part of Han Solo's character is a sort of vibe and feel and body language. I think from the minute that Alden knew he was doing it, he began thinking about that and working on it. If Solo is part Harrison Ford, he is also part Lawrence Kasdan, drafted in to complete the Empire Strikes Back screenplay screenplay following the untimely death of Lee uh, Brackett. Kasdan continued and improved on Solo's snappy banter. And some of the some of the uh, the lines in the TV spot with with he and, and Chewie are just spectacular. I can't wait to see those two together. And that's not something that I ever really desired before from the Star Wars movie. I don't think I ever really thought about wanting to see, oh, I want to see more snappy dialogue between Han Solo and and Chewbacca. I've always loved Star Wars so much that I've just been so thankful for whatever they give me. The things that I've always wanted out of Star Wars movies were more down to maybe action sequences or vehicles or vehicle design. I, I never really gave a whole lot of thought to the characters or wanting a particular character just because I always liked everybody. And so because I kind of always liked everybody, I didn't bother to think beyond what it is that I would actually want because they gave me so much of that, which I didn't know I needed already. But I can't wait to see these characters. I can't wait to find out what Kira is all about, what Val is all about, what L3 is all about, what... Um, Woody Harrelson is all about. I'm really excited for the character development in this movie because I think that's what the focus is going to be. The action scenes that we've seen so far and learning a little bit more about the uh, the Kessel Run has, is getting me, again, even more excited for these pieces of the, of the movie. Um, but even without that i think the characters in this film are going to be enough to 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 bring it across the finish line for for me and already have me totally uh, totally excited about it and again this um these uh these articles go and 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 sort of lay out character by character and one of the one of the other things that i wanted to talk about briefly was the um was the character kira played by amelia clark uh, I think the decision to cast her is really interesting, especially given her role on Game of Thrones and how diverse she is as a female lead and how she can play all parts sort of goofy, endearing, love interest, and villain. And I do believe that she's going to be one of these individuals that's going to be sort of playing a dual role. There's a reason why, in my opinion, they included in the trailer the line from Woody Harrelson, you know, don't trust, you know, don't trust anybody. That way you're never, you know, going to be going to be disappointed, you know, and Donald Glover's portrayal of Lando. I saw an interview with him and it's funny. You watch Donald Glover speak and he doesn't even need to sort of get into character mode. He already exudes the character of Lando and he approached Lando much in the same way that they talk about the Han Solo character in that it's more of a vibe and a feel. Nobody wants to do uh, an impression of the other characters. We just want to embody sort of that, that character and bring through what it is that that person is about without doing 
an impression or recreation. Go back and watch the full trailer for Solo A Star Wars Story. And right at the very beginning when Han Solo was walking up to what we assume is like that bar area where we see him going and meeting up with Lando to go play the game of Sabacc. It's um, it's a shot from behind, and there's the three guys that are standing around what's an R2 unit. I don't know if you realize that. If you look at the trailer, it's actually a hollowed-out R2 unit. That they're standing around that they're warming their hands on the fire in the middle of it. Um, but you see the you see Han Solo. He walks past the camera, and he, he walks away, and it's from, from behind. Look at the way he's walking. Look at his, his stance as he walks by, and he walks like Harrison Ford does. It's really, really specific. You need to go in and, and check that out. But I said it last week. I'll say it again this week, and I'll probably keep repeating it, and then I'll tell you whether or not I was right or wrong when Solo, a Star Wars story, comes out. But I think that Alden Ehrenreich has potential to be just as good a Han Solo, if not perhaps even a better Han Solo, than even Harrison Ford is. I really do think he has that potential. And I know that some of the early, early thought and talk – and uh, Christian Harloff on, on on Collider has made this comment that some people had seen the movie apparently and said that Alden Ehrenreich was one of the weakest parts, but the rest of the cast was was good and the movie was good. I, I, I'm not buying it. Not based off the trailers. I think that Alden Ehrenreich is going to put in a stellar performance. And I know that I was a little put off by his looks. I mean, that was probably the biggest thing that I had to kind of work myself through was that he's not Harrison Ford, right? I didn't care, but still, if you're kind of going, hey, I'm, just, I'm not seeing solo yet based off of what i've heard and seen in the trailers no i'm getting the i'm getting the solo vibe from him absolutely as a matter of fact let's use let's do this let's play the tv spot one more time and then i'll dive right into the uh listener feedback for this week so what's your name anyway hey kid it's a big shot gangster Putting together crew. You think everything sounds like a bad idea. If you come with me, you're in this life for good. I waited a long time for a shot like this. (laughs) I got a really good feeling about this. I do, you know what, and I think too that uh, this movie might be somewhat heartbreaking because the way that he's portraying Han Solo in this movie, he's very optimistic, and and that's not to say that Han Solo in the other movies wasn't, uh, but he was way more cynical. Uh, he obviously had a lighter side, but the fact that they keep using that line in multiple trailers now of "I have a really good feeling about this," and yet throughout all the other movies, it's always "I have a bad feeling about this." I think we're going to end up seeing um, Han Solo go through some major, major stuff in this uh, in this movie. Uh, I think. Uh, well, you know what? As um, as Luke Skywalker, you know, says it says it best. This is not going to go. All right, listener, feedback time. You write in, and then I respond, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, except for telling you again that I appreciate it. Talkshownerd at uh, gmail.com. I'll drop a comment on YouTube, and, of course, uh, Spreaker, Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, and if you were here in the room with me, that would be the other place where you could go, and you you could hear it if you were sitting right here. Uh, Twitter at John uh, J O N Justice, the My Nerd World on Twitter too. Please follow and um, share the podcast with your friends. It would mean the world to me if uh, if you helped me grow the grow the show. All right, let's dive into it. Uh, Bonnie uh, writes in, uh, has a lot of a uh, lot of thoughts, and I greatly appreciate you writing in, Bonnie. Um, says thanks for My Nerd World. Discovered the show a few months ago. I've become a fan. Thank you, Bonnie. I really do appreciate it. Um, All right, let's get into what she had to say, though. Regarding the use of the color red in The Last Jedi poster, uh, in addition to your mention that Ryan Johnson's use of red salt on the planet as a substitute of blood, I also read that the color red was utilized on The Last Jedi posters due to the 40th anniversary of Star Wars. Oh, 
the color for a 40th anniversary is ruby red. I did love the use of red on crate as a substitute for spilling blood. So clever and artistic. I had not heard uh, about that and the 40th anniversary correlation. Uh, the last few scenes on crate. Yes, I agree with a comment you made in episode 117. Every time I see the crate scenes, I get something out of it, especially the last few uh, scenes from uh, Luke appearing uh, to the last forced force bond. Sometimes I watch all those scenes and I walk away so hopeful. And sometimes I'm absolutely gutted and think there is no way that Ben will be redeemed alive. Sometimes I'm completely confused by why the hell Kylo slash Ben and Ray think about each other and their status in the galaxy and story right now. I do agree that Han and Luke and maybe even Leia's deaths will be for nothing if Ben is not redeemed and lives out his life. Force ghost Anakin? Yes, please. Can't remember the podcast, but I agree. I would love that. Seems like Kylo needs Anakin to show up. Plus, I also wonder, in The Force Awakens, does Kylo just talk and meditate to Vader's uh, Darth Vader's old mask? Does it answer back? If Darth Vader's mask did answer back... Was it Snoke that answered? That's why I would love to see Anakin's Force Ghost. He could set the record straight, so to speak. But as you recently said about writing for the story's sake and not for the fans, that is my fangirl wish, and J.J. has written the script, and he sure did not call me. Uh, let me stop here real quick. She makes one more point, and then we'll get, we'll get to some other, uh, some other comments this week. I would love to see that, and I think it would be great if Force Ghost Anakin was the thing that actually redeemed or made... Kylo Ren decide to embrace Ben Solo and come back. Like at a point of of height of 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 him going dark side or at a turning point in the film to have a Force Ghost Anakin show up would be I think would be fantastic to see that. To have Anakin be the one to say no dude, you stop. Don't do what I did. Uh, and if it was, I'm just going to go to the hopeless romantic in me. If it was Anakin going, dude, you got a good thing here with Ray. What the heck are you doing? I know what happened with me and Padme and I shouldn't have gone down that road and she died and it sucked. And I yelled out, no, and became this black behemoth in this black suit. <laughs> that would be amazing. But now I'm fangirling, I guess. This is the fanboy wish, right? Okay. Um, all right, back to uh, <laughs> back to Bonnie's uh, comment here. Um, in Little Kylo's drawings, you referenced the drawing with the blank sheet of paper saying nothing. Uh, those Calvin and Hobbes-inspired drawings are drawn by a former Disney animator, Brian Kissinger. I think he has an Etsy account, she says. He's on Twitter and Instagram. Um, okay, Bonnie, thank you so much. I actually think I read that before, but I've forgotten. Thank you so much for the uh, for the email. I really, uh, really appreciate it. All right, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Gen X7 writes this. Love your podcast. Thank you. Love you. Always refreshing to hear someone excited about Star Wars. Uh, we can choose to pick the hell out of something, or we can just appreciate that we have it. Some people are happy in their misery. Sad. I'm going to enjoy Star Wars for as long as I can. Love The Last Jedi. Pumped as well uh, after the trailer for Solo. Uh, frequent uh, commentator, Misconduct1, writes this. Uh, John, I respect your opinions a great deal. And I'm wondering if you could help me settle a, hmm, I'll call it a family geek argument. Because my entire family is nothing but film nerds. LOL. I have two sons, 20 and 18. My daughter is 16. My husband and I were having dinner with my brother. By the way, I'm going to say this up front. Um, I've read this. Your husband's wrong. Okay, let me get back to it. Uh, <laughs> My husband and I were having dinner with my brother, my mom, and our kids when the solo movie came up in a discussion. There was a bit of an argument that got started about which character was more popular and iconic that were both played by Harrison, Solo or Indiana Jones. This all started with a discussion about whether or not Harrison could be replaced as Han Solo. Since you did touch on the subject in this particular podcast, I'm hoping you could help me out. My side of the argument was that I believe the character of Han Solo can survive a recast for the same reasons you said. New generation love for the character, and it can work better than a recast of Indiana Jones because Han Solo is a more iconic and well-known character from a much bigger franchise. I love Indiana Jones, but I'm pretty sure Han is a way more iconic character. He is. 
I can ask a five-year-old who Han Solo is, and I'm pretty sure they would say the guy from Star Wars. But if I ask who Indiana Jones is, I'm pretty sure they would stare at me blankly. And I'm a pre-K teacher. I know this for a fact. I asked some of my kids in my class this argument, and six of my boys knew Han, zero knew Indiana Jones. Everyone at the table was siding with my husband. Oh, I'm so sorry that everybody at your table was so horribly wrong. And my <laughs> and my boys, that Indiana was more popular or more well-known, more iconic. Help me, Obi John Kenobi. Ooh, I like that. You're my only hope. Settle this argument. <laughs> these, these are the strange arguments that my family gets into at dinner. So uh, who do you think is more onic, Han or, or Indy? Uh, let's see. And do you think the character of Han Solo can be embraced by a new generation considering how long the character has stood the test of time? Because I do. And I'm excited to see Alvin as Han Solo, even though my first love will always be Mr. Ford's portrayal of Han. All right, so your husband and everybody else at the table is totally wrong. Both are iconic characters. Han Solo is exponentially more iconic than Indiana Jones. And all you have to do is look at the the longevity of the films, the number of films, and look at the last Indiana Jones movie. Look, I liked the Temple of the uh, uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I, I know why people didn't, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was a fun movie. And it suffered the same type of ridiculous criticism that The Last Jedi is suffering from. When people go and overly analyze Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but you compare it to what happened in the other movies, and it's just as outlandish, uh, outlandish and outrageous as the other movies. But our nostalgia gets in the way of being able to look at a newer version of the movie in the same way we did before. We don't like hearing other people. We don't do a good job hearing from other people. It was a simpler time back when we didn't have Twitter and Facebook. Okay. Uh, now, be that as it may, again, they're both iconic characters, but Han Solo is absolutely the more the more iconic and the more well-known. And I actually feel that Indiana Jones would have a more difficult time being recast because of the fact that it's not as popular. I think people care more about that character because of, of Harrison Ford. If they continue on with the Indiana Jones franchise, it, it's going to be with a different with another character that's like Indiana Jones, but not Indiana Jones, in my opinion. I, I just I just don't see going back and doing other earlier Indiana Jones movies with another character. That's not to say, or another actor. That's not to say they can't. That's not to say I wouldn't embrace it. But I don't think it has the ability to be as successful. Han Solo and Alden Ehrenreich certainly can. One of the biggest reasons I think it, it, it can is because... The Han Solo that's freshest in our minds right now is the older version of Harrison Ford that we saw in The Force Awakens. It's not the younger version that we saw in the in Return of the Jedi. And so when we go back and look at a younger Han Solo, I think that we're more capable of embracing somebody else playing the character because the character that we see fresh in our minds right now being the current Harrison Ford, he isn't even really like the younger Harrison Ford either. Does that make sense? Like, I'm looking at a picture of Harrison Ford right now on the Force Awakens poster, and if I put it right next to a picture of Harrison Ford from the Empire Strikes Back poster, he looks very different. He's much older, and his face looks much different. Carrie Fis Fisher looks much different. And I think, look, she looks different for other reasons. Obviously, she's had some, some, she had some work done that changed the, way, the features of her face. I cannot see Carrie Fisher in... In the Princess Leia of either movie, I just, I just, I don't see, Car I don't, see, I don't see the Princess Leia that we saw in the original trilogy. That's not a slide on Carrie Fisher at all. That is just to say she looks very, very different. She has a completely different nose in these other, in these other films. Um, on top of the fact that she was much older at the time, and and for me personally, I, I also wouldn't have a problem if they recast her for Episode Nine. But that's just that's just me. So misconduct one, I'm kind of getting off of what you were talking about. But no, Han Solo is the more iconic character. Look, there's a simple way to solve this problem. Which of the movies is more popular, Indiana Jones or Star Wars? The star, your argument's over. Star Wars is. This is absolutely. <laughs> so I, I fail to see how you can have a character in Indiana Jones be more iconic than a character that was in Star Wars when Star Wars is exponentially more popular than Indiana Jones. Your husband is totally wrong, and you should get a divorce. I was totally joking. I don't believe that for a second. I just wanted to get a reaction. All right. Uh, let's see. JG writes this in regards to the music. I think it's fitting. It matches the character and the look of the film that we've got to see so far of Solo, a Star Wars, uh, a, a Star Wars story. Um, 
Not the sweeping orchestral score of the trilogy films, but retains the Star Wars melodies in the background to tie it all together. I like it. I do, too. A uh, friend of the show, uh, Amanda writes, I'm hoping that Solo, a Star Wars story, will speak of the symbolism of the dice, since that is connected to Ben Solo. Leia left that dice for Ben to find it. The novel states that Ben played with those dice as a child. It's interesting to note that Kira was holding the dice in some of the promotional material. Hmm, luck be a lady? Yeah, I'm really... Really curious why Kira's got that dice. And I've heard some people comment that they don't want Kira to be a love interest for Solo in Solo a Star Wars Story. Because people have a hard time um, putting another female with Han prior to when he met Leia. And to that I say, you don't live in the real world, do you? (laughs) I like that idea a lot. I really do. Especially given the fact that Han Solo and Princess Leia didn't live happily ever after. Right? I like the idea that maybe Han Solo did have a first love. Look. There's a reason why the saying, the one that got away, is the saying, the one that got away. Because sometimes there's ones that, in our mind, got away. It doesn't mean that they were the right person. But it does mean that there are people that we had connections to when we were younger that didn't end up lasting. And you kind of look back and you go, oh, I wonder what would have happened. Even if you're in a completely happy and totally place and you're satisfied and you've got your life partner and you love them more than life itself, right? Those other people can still exist. And I love the idea of Han being jaded for for a reason. And maybe being a little bit standoffish. Or maybe even, hmm, <laughs> I don't know how this would go over. Or maybe even we find out that he was always looking for that. There's a line in the in the trailer of, you know what? Let me just let's let's go ahead and do this. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and play the full uh the full trailer. Uh, Because I like to throw in some audio where we can throw audio in. There's a moment in the full trailer where you hear from from Kira. And she's talking about Han and 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 what's going on here. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and give this thing a give this thing a listen. You're after something. Is it revenge? Money. Or is it something else? Mm -hmm. You look good. A little rough around the edges, but good. Heard about a job. Big shot gangster putting together a crew. I'm a driver. And I'm a flyer. I waited a long time for a shot like this. What do you think? Well, what do you know? You got a line on a ship? Yeah, I know a guy. He's the best smuggler around. I heard a story about you. I was wondering if it's true. Everything you've heard about me is true. Whoa. <laughs> L3! Let's go with a mean man's face. Who are these guys? If you come with us, you're in this life for good. You might want to buckle up, baby. Give you some advice. We assume everyone will betray you, and you will never be disappointed. I got a really good feeling about this. Since when do you know how to fly? 190 years old? You look great. Push it. Oh, I cannot wait for this movie. All right, uh, I was just wiping out, just geeking off off the trailer again. It could be nothing, 
But the fact when 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 Kira is laying out, you know, you're looking for something. Is it money or is it something else? I like the, and I I'm, and this is not this is me just fanboying. I'm not saying that I'm going to be disappointed if it doesn't happen. But I like this idea that if the dice did come from Kira, maybe she betrays him. Maybe she dies. Maybe she's one of the big reasons why he ends up being by himself and going off on his own. Not only when we see him at the beginning of A New Hope, why he's so hesitant to join the Rebellion, why he's going to leave again at the beginning of The Empire Strikes Back. He only gets committed to everybody by Return of the Jedi, and by the time we get to The Force Awakens, he's back out on his own with Han, with uh, with Chewie again. Right? To me, what's the thing that can make a man so hesitant and reluctant to be close to anybody, even somebody like Princess Leia, well, maybe he lost somebody that he really loved deeply beforehand and it never left him. And I know this is this is going to be a fun movie, it's going to be a humorous movie, but people have been saying from the get-go, and I think it was actually um, Doug Chang from the from the artistic uh, element of, of Disney and Lucasfilm that said this was one of the greatest scripts he'd ever, he'd ever written. I don't think they would say that because of the action sequences in the comedy. I think there's, there's some depth here to the character development and that Hong gets betrayed in, in, in so many different ways by so many different people that it becomes very cynical. But I also think that something very weighty happens to him and it makes sense that it would happen with this girl who we know in the movies he starts off with and she has that she has in that in that artwork that Amanda was talking about she's got that dice um when they're younger F- from the beginning part of the trailer that we've seen the outfit she's wearing and what was actually put out on the uh what was released as the action figure is the younger Kira she's got that dice then so I'm really, really curious to see how that plays in. And we, and again, that's the one thread we know apart from the man himself that carries all the way from Solo a Star Wars story all the way to The Last Jedi. All right. Uh, let's see. Back to the listener feedback. Uh, JG uh, writes, I'm also a romantic. Uh, I think it's the second one from JG this week, but it's totally fine. Um, I'm hoping for the redemption of Ben, of, of ben Solo. Uh, for nine, as opposed to Kylo remaining the dominant persona, while putting aside childish, childish things, the mask and becoming a man, destroying the physical mask in The Last Jedi that be, uh, began that process. Anything else seems like it would be too complex to wrap up in one movie. Whatever J.J. comes up with will be good. A good watch regardless. Totally agree. All right, Miss Suki, 777, says this. Hadn't given Solo the Solo movie much thought, but the trailer did look really good, and now I'm looking forward to seeing it. When I heard the music and you mentioned Shiny, reminded me of Firefly, a fantastic space western that only got one series. Why? I remember my first, well, why? Um, I don't think it was very popular, but I love Serenity. Serenity is a fantastic film. As a matter of fact, if you're looking to satisfy your movie-watching experience before Solo A Star Wars Story... Serenity is the movie because that is essentially Solo. That character in that movie is basically um, Han Solo. I don't know if, if you guys realize that or not. Um, I remember my first words after watching uh, The Last Jedi. My daughter asked about the film. I said, I think some of the fans may have a problem with it. I never expected it to divide the fans as much as it did. Having said that, I even had a few issues on first watching, mainly Canto Bite. But still find uh, myself forwarding that part sometimes. But the rest of the film, I love it. And it will probably end up being my favorite Star Wars. Thank you for answering my comment in the uh, 116 show. And are you going to talk about the special features on the Blu-ray? Thanks again uh, for another great show. Uh, You know, I spent some time talking about the director and the Jedi. But maybe I should spend a little bit more time talking about the special features um, in a uh, in a future podcast, so I'll certainly uh, jot that down on a list of uh, of, of topics. Um, let's see, Jenna uh, Kolka, and I think I say your name wrong every time. Your podcast gives me so much happiness, even though I butcher your name, Jenna. <laughs> I love your positivity, and I know you have mentioned before that you're a Christian man, and so it's wonderful how open you are about it. I think God is going to do some incredible and inspiring things for you through this podcast. Oh, wow. Thank you for that. I I appreciate that. Praying for your success, and I think we need uh, more strong, respectable men of God like you in the world. You are way too kind. Um, As for Solo, uh, the Solo movie, don't hate me, but I was not excited for this until I saw the trailer. I'm still gung-ho on us getting a Yoda anthology movie and an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie. 
I feel like that's what everybody is asking for. And this kind of threw everybody off. I personally don't think this is Disney's smartest decision, but you're right. They're not going to put out a crap product. It is it is visually stunning, and it's going to be a really great fun movie for what it is, but it's controversial for sure. Do you think the success or failure of Solo is going to affect the future Star Wars story movies? I think that... Uh, let me back up here real quick. First off, thank you for all the kind words. Uh, that's really sweet of you to say, and it means a lot. And I, I really... I really, really do um, appreciate that. Um, I am not one clamoring for a Yoda or even Obi-Wan Kenobi movie. Um, I'll find if I'm get them, but I kind of feel the same way I do about those about the possibility of those two movies the way I did Solo. That being said, you start giving me a, a Yoda or a Obi-Wan Kenobi movie, I'll be the first one to buy tickets for two days straight to go see it in the theater, and I'll probably spend a bunch of podcasts talking about it. So what do I know? Um, I think the future of the of the of the anthology films, of the uh, Star Wars stories movies. I, I think there is a bit of hinging upon the success of this movie. If this movie ends up doing gangbusters at the box office, and then I think that you'll see many more um, spinoff films like Solo, A Star Wars Story. If it just does okay, then I think what we're already seeing them map out, the Ryan Johnson trilogy the movies with the Game of Thrones guys, is going to be the future. But I think if Solo does really, really well, and I think it's not going to bring it home opening weekend. It'll do great. I'm with everybody that says about 150000 unless the interest really starts to peak here in the next few weeks, uh, which I, I already kind of see it beginning to pick up steam. I mean, look, use me as the example. I was I was not excited for this movie at all, even though I was planning on seeing it opening night and the day after. Now, I cannot wait to see this movie. So, if my level of enthusiasm after seeing this footage is any indication that I think this movie is poised to do a lot better than they had expected. I also think that it's going to do better on the long haul. But I think the future of the spin-off movies like this will rest somewhat on whether or not this is this is successful. And I think it's also part of the reason why we haven't had that Obi-Wan Kenobi announcement movie. And I know that that was supposed to be announced like June of last year. A script was supposed to be already written. The director might have been already in place, but Disney never came out and, and solidified um, anything in regards to that. So... I think part of the reason why is because there was so much turmoil over the Solo movie that they just wanted to go ahead and, and wait. Um, Megan writes this. I'm not sure where the question of the Pride and Prejudice listener um, question is from, but they she included a link, and it was. It was Eddie Redmayne discussing his audition for Kylo Ren where he talks about uh, using lines from Pride and Prejudice. And oh my goodness gracious, can you imagine Eddie, Red, uh, Eddie Redmayne playing Kylo Ren? No, I don't even want to think about it. It's just an awful thought. I, just, not that I'm anti-Eddie Redmayne. He's just a weird dude, and I don't want to... I can't see him playing opposite um, Daisy Ridley. No, uh, no, no, no. All right, one more. Um, L uh, B writes this. Great show as always. Thank you. I'm happy with whatever uh, show format works for your schedule. What makes your show great is you, your unique feelings about Star Wars, the stuff nobody else can do because it's personal to you. And she was responding to a couple of podcasts ago where I talked about splitting up the um, the listener commentary with the uh, with the rest of the show, which I obviously decided not to do. So you're stuck with a longer episode every week. And that's it for um, the My Nerd World and Star Wars podcast this week uh once again thank you so much for checking out the show and uh, all the comments really do uh appreciate it uh, as always talk show nerd at gmail.com leave a comment on youtube uh, and then follow it spreaker stitcher itunes podbean iheart and here in my room if you happen to be here when i'm recording right you could be like right over there listening to me do it um live even though that hasn't happened yet so uh thanks again everybody <laughs> for checking out the show this week i hope that uh, you enjoyed listening to it as much as i enjoyed recording it and i'll be back again uh next week Bye bye the force will be with you always my nerd road <laughs>